everyone. Um, so just a quick agenda. Uh, we'll do a few minutes of opening remarks and some background information on this panel, and then we will introduce our wonderful panelists to you. Um, we are so lucky to have them, and I'm so excited to hear what they have to say. Um, we'll lead them through some guided questions, hopefully had some great discussion, and then we will have time at the end, hopefully, for some audience questions. So if you have some, stick them in the chat whenever or keep them to yourselves, and we can have that discussion at the end. Okay, so um, non-human animal use is abundant in our society, as many of you probably already know. Um, experimental research involves a global annual usage of over 190 million animals. Estimates of the corresponding figure for farmed animals are even higher at approximately 50 billion. Um, other animal uses include entertainment and conservation like zoos, circuses, or aquariums, companionship like pets, and working animals like service, police, military, or herding animals. Um, there's also widespread public concern about the use of animals and a wide ranging interdisciplinary research agenda to study animal welfare, um, which our panelists will know because they are all part of this. Um, public attitudes to animals, to animal use and animal welfare are an important metric for diverse stakeholders. So attitudes towards ethical non-human animal use vary greatly depending on environmental, animal and view holder factors. So exploring attitudes towards animal use can actually help us predict behavior towards animals. So for example, Coleman and colleagues have demonstrated that stock persons with negative attitudes towards pigs were more likely to hit, slap and push them than stock persons with positive attitudes towards them. So this type of negative human animal interaction decreases both animal welfare as well as productivity. Studies have examined different view holder factors that may contribute to these attitudes. So some of these influential factors, like you see on the screen, may include religion, gender, early experience with animals, education level, beliefs about animal mentality, etc. Um, research also shows that length of time or in an environment or a career may impact attitudes towards animals. So um, an example of this is a re recent UK study found that veterinary students in their later years of study um, rated um, animals as having lower levels of sentience compared to students who were in their earlier years of study, um, which is an interesting finding. Um, lastly, attitudes are shown to vary depending on species and purpose of animal use. So there was a study done in 2020 surveying 483 participants to establish attitudes towards animal use across a variety of settings. Um, and these results showed that overall there was a higher level of agreement with the use of animals in medical research and um, basic science, but this varied by species. Um, there was less endorsement overall for food production and pest control, and even less endorsement for the use of animals for entertainment or cultural reasons, irrespective of species. So as you can see, this was just a general overview of some of the things that might impact attitudes towards animals. Um, another factor is legislation. So legislation regulating animal use is dependent on the country or region, as well as the governing body that's in place there. So legislation typically discriminates by species in that across a variety of, of purposes of use, some species are more protected than others. For example, animals on the con Convention on International Trade in, in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, which is like the longest title ever, um, list of specially protected species should not be used for any purposes. So they say that those species cannot be used at all. But when considering potential use in research laboratories, non-human primates are afforded higher levels of protection than say rodents. Um, as well, the US Animal Welfare Act of 1970 specified that rats, mice, and birds are not animals under the legislation governing the protection of animals in research. And although not legally prohibited, um, except for rabbits, pet species and companion animals are rarely considered to be suitable for human consumption, at least in the UK, Canada, and the US. So pet species such as dogs and cats have different status to fish or chickens that might be labeled produce or rats and mice that might be labeled pests. And then lastly, practices and animal welfare considerations in different animal use or care industries likely also vary um, in relation to many factors. So these factors that I'm gonna talk about obviously may impact things and may not. We're just giving you a general overview all, of all the things that could possibly impact um, practices and animal welfare considerations. So for one, the potential benefit to humans versus the cost to the animal. So this is just taking a general utilitarian perspective, maximizing happiness. Um, also the purpose of the industry. So for example, farms and zoos um, that might be for profit institutions and need to center profits at least in line with or ahead of welfare. Um, 
and in contrast, maybe companion animals, typically there's um, the enjoyment of the human and the animal's welfare that might be centered. For working animals, it might need their ability to perform a certain task that might be prioritized over welfare. Um, as well, there's tradition. So some cultures or industries are older and newer than others. Some are more founded in tradition and some are more founded in current industry recommendations that might align with new research or scientific findings and some may not. Um, species also may play a role in this. Attitudes to animals, uh, animal use can vary wi widely depending on the perceived characteristics of the species in question. Um, and this may influence people's emotional response to them and perception of their instrumental value. So for example, conservation effort efforts are typically greater for larger, more attractive mammals, particularly those who share some similarities to humans. Um, as well as perceived cognitive ability, um, is likely a moderating variable um, as humans estimate of intelligence of other species correspond with how we treat them. Um, and then lastly, labels that we give them have been reported to influence perceptions of their moral standing and judgments of their sentience or of different species. Um, and obviously then the, the legitimacy of using them for human purposes will vary based on geographical area, culture, or um, possibly even individual differences. Um, so moving on from that, I'll pass it over to Anna. Uh, thanks. Um, so yeah, therefore, it should not come as a surprise that the study of animal welfare is influenced by these same factors that affect the perception of animals and their respective value. Um, animal welfare science is a particularly unique field as it is influenced by ethics and morality. For one, there is no agreed upon universal definition of animal welfare and scientists are working with concepts colored by their own personal views. These can influence the scientific approach from the way and type of data that is collected to the conclusions that are drawn. While animal welfare scientists strive to understand and improve the well being of animals, practices and recommendations depend on individual stances on ethical questions, such as is it justifiable to use a few to help the many? Or can we trade physical health for behavioral freedom? To explore these discrepancies in greater detail, we are super excited to have today's discussion with panelists from different industry sectors studying different species. And so with this, it is my great honor to present to you our five panelists. We have Dr. Lynn Stannan, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Göteborg and is investigating the welfare of fish and other aquatic animals. Dr. Sarah Dubois is the Chief Scientific Officer for the BCSBCA and an adjunct professor at the University of British Columbia. She specializes in welfare of wildlife. Dr. Joanna Makowska is the Laboratory Animal Advisor for the Animal Welfare Institute and also an adjunct professor at the UBC. Talking today about laboratory rat welfare. Dr. Cassandra Tucker is a professor from the University of California, Davis and she is our agricultural animal welfare expert. And last but not least, Dr. Carly Moody is a recent CISO alumni and now an assistant professor at the University of California, Davis, and specializing in companion animal welfare. So thank you all for making the time to be here today. I'm looking forward to a riveting discussion. I would like to give each of you the opportunity now to introduce yourselves, maybe mention the species that you're mostly working with and briefly tell us why you study animal welfare. Uh, Lynn, and I'm also why just going start? to pin yeah. you so that everyone can see you. Oh, perfect. 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 Sorry, keep going, Anna. That's all right. Um, actually, I was going to ask Lynn to maybe tell us a bit about herself. Thank you very much, Anna. And thank you to you and Quinn and the student chapter for inviting me to be part of this panel discussion. Looks like it's going to be really interesting. Um, so my name is Dr. Lynn Snedden, and you please, please call me Lynn. Um, I'm based at University of Gothenburg. I've been there for 18 months. And previously, I was doing research at the University of Liverpool in the UK for 18 years. And I've been studying animal welfare for the last 23 years, which makes me feel very old. Um, and uh, basically, I'm very, very interested in 
why animals do what they do, and particularly in science that can help us interpret why problems in captivity arise. So we have a great understanding of, of, of the wild animal or the wild ancestor or counterpart, then we can understand why problems arise in captivity. And then we can do science that can uh, aim to, to really improve the welfare of animals that are under our care. And my um, area is very much about aquatic animal welfare. So um, most of the models I use are fishes and I've studied um, all the negative things, unfortunately, which are pain, fear and stress and fishes and, and spent quite a lot of my time um, trying to um, um, investigate this in question of suffering and fishes to really drive the agenda with respect to, the, to welfare improvements in the way that we treat them. And more recently, um, I have funding to work on the welfare of crustaceans, that's crabs, lobsters, prawns, and so on. And also um, the welfare of cuttlefish, which of course are a cephalopod and, and closely related to octopus and squid. And um, the reason I study animal welfare is uh, I really get a buzz from doing science that actually is meaningful and, and that can actually make a difference in the animal's lives. And by showing simple things like providing enrichment to fish in captivity can seriously improve their welfare, make them more resilient to stress. And it's such a simple thing, but you know, without the scientific data, people won't change their ways. So um, one of the driving forces behind me studying this is that you can actually make a difference with the science. It's not just academic, it's not just a, a sort of knowledge pursuit, it actually has a, applied relevance. So thank you. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, Carly, would you like to tell us about yourself? Hi everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm Carly and I'm a new assistant professor here in the Department of Animal Science um, at the University of California, Davis. And I've recently started up the Animal Welfare Epi Lab here. Um, so I have a animal welfare and epidemiology um, background. So my research is primarily focused on companion cats, um, but I have conducted research in a lot of different areas um, with a lot of different species. Um, I've worked in the laboratory animal industry, so I've conducted research with laboratory mice and rats, um, and I've also recently started work in dairy goat behavior and welfare, <laughs> so a lot of uh, different things. Um, my research areas um, of interest are really um, examining approaches for mitigating agonistic interactions um, in socially housed animals, um, improving human animal interactions. So I've done a lot of human animal interaction um, work, um, both um, looking at handling in cats um, and some questionnaire work with um, the veterinary industry, um, as well as pet owners. And I'm also really interested in reducing procedural uh, pain and stress. So that's an area that I hope to do more work in in the near future. Um, industries that I mostly work with are the veterinary industry. So I work with a lot of veterinarians, um, veterinary staff, so vet techs um, and other staff members, um, pet owners, animal shelters. Um, and I also still do some work with the laboratory animal industry. Um, I also work with some nonprofit organizations such as the ASPCA. Um, and then I just wanted to mention that my preferred pronouns are she, her. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Cassandra, would you like to go next? Sure, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so I work in the agricultural sector, as you mentioned before, um, and I, I work with cattle, both dairy and beef, um, but the answers I'll give to today's questions, I'll focus more on dairy, um, because that's the sector I've worked in for longer. Um, and if I had to summarize my, my research program, I'm really interested in understanding the animal's perspective and, and how they respond to and how they experience husbandry and management procedures uh, that we that are common, um, common on dairy farms. Um, and I'm very, very much, I really resonate a lot with what Lynn was saying in terms of, um, I'm really interested in, in having the knowledge that I generate, not just live in the academy or in the ivory tower, but that it also 
um, is extended out and, and used in, to influence the day-to-day -day care of, of cattle. Amazing. Um, Sarah, why don't you take it away? Hello, thank you very much for having me today. Um, my preferred pronouns are she, her, ou elle pour les francophones. Uh, I am based in uh, Vancouver. I work for the British Columbia Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, and I am an adjunct professor at the University of British Columbia. So uh, I do support a practicum program for students there, but my main role as chief scientific officer at the BCSBC means that I oversee our farm animal welfare, our wild animal welfare, animal kind, and companion animal welfare science and policy programs. So uh, I have a diverse team set of experts that work for me, which is exciting, but my background is in wildlife. And I came into the animal welfare field after uh, undergraduate experience where, you know, I, I thought I was gonna be a wildlife biologist. I thought I was gonna be on, you know, the Cousteau's boats, but I didn't do very well. Uh, as a scuba diver. So then I thought, okay, land mammals is where I'm going to head. And uh, I worked, you know, with Parks Canada and our Ministry of Environment here, and I just saw a lack of um, real concern for the individual animal state and that animals were used, of course, in, in wildlife research and in conservation research. And it just, um, you know, there wasn't consideration for how the impact we were impacting this one animal, putting a collar on it, and just to get data for the larger population. So I was very fortunate to join the animal welfare program uh, over 20 years ago now and have done uh, different work in the area of animals and entertainment, uh, captive wildlife, but primarily with wildlife rehabilitation. And so the industries that I work with, um, it's, it's a little bit harder because I work in the animal welfare sector. And so we have many different intersecting industries that of course we, um, pay attention to and, and keep track of, but um, partnering in research um, most recently has been in the area of pest control, which is um, something that, um, you know, I've seen a lot of negative impacts of pest control through wildlife rehabilitation. So that's where that um, interest has come. And um, how did I, why did I study animal welfare? I, I, again, it's just uh, ensuring that we can make a difference and cause societal change, whether it's through attitudes or evidence um, as an organization. I think that that's the driving factor for our work. So there you go. Beautiful. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and Joanna. Hi, thank you. I'll echo everybody else and say thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. I think it's a really fun experience. Um, so as said, I work as an adjunct professor at UBC in the animal welfare program. That's where I did my graduate work as well. Um, so in that capacity, I get to supervise students mostly. I don't really run my own projects, but I supervise students running different projects. So we get to generate new data. Uh, my focus has always been with rodents, uh, mice and rats. And lately I've been focusing on improvements to housing and, and letting animals have a good life. Um, I'm also the laboratory animal advisor for the Animal Welfare Institute. It's a nonprofit that's based in Washington, DC. In that role, it's more of an advocacy in getting all these refinements, all this research that we generate and getting that out to the people who work with the animals. So mostly veterinarians, researchers, and animal care technicians. The reason I study animal welfare, um, I guess I was always very curious about animals and what they thought and what their worldview was like and what they felt. Um, similar to Sarah, I thought I'd be more of a biologist and an ethologist, um, but after an undergraduate thesis experience, I realized that what I wanted was to do that, but also for my results to actually be applied to improve the lives of animals, not just for knowledge's sake. Um, throughout my undergraduate degree, I had learned a lot about how lab animals are treated, so I had a special affinity towards understanding their experience and improving that if possible. Lovely. Um, so before we move on to the next one, I would like to ask everyone who is here um, to please let us know what industry you primarily work with, um, and we will share the poll results at the end. We have um, we have a few polls going on through here because who doesn't love a good poll? Um, yeah. So please let us know um, what you what sector you primarily work with. Um, okay. So we're going to start off with. Um, possibly a difficult question, but possibly an easy question. Um, what is your definition of animal welfare and what do you use to inform this definition? Um, so if we have someone who would like to start us off, 
Absolutely. Otherwise, I will just pick someone. <laughs> Okay, we'll go with um, Cassandra. Why don't you start us off? Great, yeah, so when I think about how the considerations I have when I'm defining animal welfare, um, I really, I think I've been really influenced by Marion Dawkins' definition. Um, I really, I, she, she frames it as, are animals healthy and do they have what they want? Um, and I think that although that's it's a very simple way of thinking about it, I, I, when, when you dig in, it encompasses many of the kinds of concerns that we have about um, animals uh, that we that we have contact contact with. So are they healthy, and do they have what they want? Amazing, thank you. I just read her book on that. So, um, uh, Carly. Please share if and also if you yeah. agree with the previous people or if you have other things to add, feel free to be like that, but also this. Yeah, no, I 100% agree with Cassandra. Um, I think subjective experiences of positive valence are really key to animal welfare. Um, so those positive effective states are really important. And so I think it goes beyond just satisfying basic needs. Um, we also have to think more about behavioral needs motivations, um, giving animals a choice, I think is really important. So being free to make choices about what they do and what they don't want. Yeah, perfect. Um, Sarah, do you have anything to add to that? So in addition to an animal state, um, when I talk about animal welfare to our supporters, you know, it is actually a movement for them. This is how the animal welfare sector is, was established. You know, people's compassion for animals. Um, we have now an entire sector and an industry in Canada that is focused on animal welfare. So I think that's important to, to frame in, in terms of how the public thinks of animal welfare. But also I think it's, you know, an, an ethical position, I think along a spectrum, because we're often asked, you know, where we fall on that uh, spectrum for certain species, and it's it's not always as clear. It's not the same thing for for all animals necessarily in the animal welfare sector, and it's different among organizations. So within the sector, so I think that's that's some considerations we have as well. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, um, Lynn. Yeah, I totally agree with Cassandra Carly. I also think the Marion Stamp Dockings definition of welfare makes life so much simpler for everyone rather than confusing the traditional three measures biological functioning nature-based and feelings-based actually is the animal well which we can easily measure and does it have what it wants in its environment and that's something we can look at via various approaches such as preference tests or the lack of stereotypical behaviors an extension to that more recently has been do the animals have a, a life worth living and i think that really ties into what sarah is saying about the public and how they drive welfare science the public want animals to have a wonderful life before they end up on their plate or whatever way they're using them and and that's something that's quite challenging to measure really do the animals have a life worth living um and so you know that's um a bit more of a difficult thing to really get a hold of i mean you can certainly um look at wild animal welfare and think oh, they must have a great life but of course there's so much that humans are doing to the environment that's having a very negative impact on the welfare of wild animals um, and so, yeah, that's a challenge for us all, I think. Totally. I think also the public perception, I like that a lot of you brought up public perception because I think it is so important in driving it, but at the same time might be an anthropomorphic view of mm. animal welfare because possibly the public doesn't see it from a scientific perspective. So it's really interesting. Um, Joanna, go for it. Yeah, um, I also agree with everybody. Marion Dawkins' definition is great. I use that to guide my own work. Um, I also, life worth living or a good life is something that I'm really looking into lately. But like another piece that I wanted to add is coming from the animal welfare program at UBC with David Fraser. I do use his definition as well with the three spheres of biological functioning, effective states and natural living. Um, the reason I like it for lab animals specifically is that 
I find in laboratories, there is a huge focus on biological functioning and people tend to equate welfare to the animal is healthier, is it, it does have communicable diseases and that's often at the cost of psychological well-being. Um, so I really like that definition of the spheres where it's a balance of the three. So you kind of stress that, hey, yes, it has to be, the animal has to be healthy, but psychology also really matters and we have to find the right balance. Totally, absolutely. Um, speaking of everyone having different opinions, I will launch another poll if you guys want to fill in. You can answer as many different ones as you want. So click whichever ones you think um, might go into your own definition. Um, and Anna, you can introduce the next question if you'd like. Yeah, so we were wondering um, if, in obviously, in your opinion, um, how much your industry or the stakeholders in your industry are sharing your opinion on, on what you just talked about. So maybe Joanna, if you just wanna, wanna continue from what you just said, how much do you feel like the people in laboratories um, would, would have the same ideas as you do? Um, like I said, I think there's a really, really strong focus on the physical well-being above all. Um, often when you look at literature on environmental enrichment for rodents, for example, one of the barriers that's often cited is safety of the animal. Um, so there's huge concerns that it'll somehow impact. I mean, I know people who don't want to add a bed to a dog kennel in laboratories because they're afraid that the dog will eat it and become sick. And so it doesn't, you know, everything kind of falls to the wayside if there's any concern for any potential um, health effect. So I, I would definitely say that there's a strong emphasis on that. That being said, I find that animal care technicians, so people who care for the animals tend to have more of a view that aligns with mine, that they'll focus a little more on the effective states of the animals as well. But it's a hard position because the researchers often will not focus on that. Like they paid a lot of money for the animal. The research matter is like they can't lose the animal. So they'll really just focus on that. So we're trying to, to stress that balance there and that both matter and how effective states do affect biology as well. Um, so yeah, one thing that you find is they always, people tend to stress the biological functioning of the animals, but that really seems to be very, a very narrow definition as well, where it means like no injuries or no communicable diseases, but they kind of disregard metabolism and joint issues and all of that other stuff that happens when the animals are sedentary for their entire life. Um, so. Thank you. Um, Cassandra, do you have that a similar experience in, in agriculture maybe? I mean, I guess it's like it's a <laughs> there's a lot of people involved in agriculture. So maybe what I can speak about is just about my experience in communicating and talking about these issues, like from my from my own perspective. I I mean, I, I find. I mean, in some ways, like I, 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 I do experience what Joanna is describing and that I, I find there's less confusion. Um, or maybe even less resistance when talking about biological function and, and particularly also the productivity of the animals, how much milk they produce, how fast they grow, um, these kinds of things. But I also experience, um, although that may be sometimes what people say, um, it, there's also still some cognitive dissonance because I mean, I think that when we look, for example, at the dairy sector, we see some measures or outcomes that are associated with biological function that are still very poor. Um, so we have a high proportion of the animals that experience some form of lameness or gait abnormality. We see on some farms, very high mortality rates um, of animals that die unassisted. So they're not being, it's not just euthana euthanasia, it's actually animals that are just dying on the farm. Um, yes. It, yeah, so that I find that there's there's even even within some of the sector, some of these different areas that we could think about in terms of like if the animals are healthy or if they have what they want, that still there can be areas or topics within that are that are very occluded um, and and not not addressed, even if even if there might be more openness to talking about them. Thank you. That is a very interesting um, point to that. I'm wondering in, in aquatic animals, Lynn, do people share concern about the welfare of fishes? 
Yeah, I think that in the aquaculture industry, people want healthy, well-growing animals. So it's very much about biological functioning. It's very much about are the animals growing and are they disease free? And that's the real focus is on diseases because um, some of these diseases can just wipe out an entire um, farm of fish or some of the diseases, if you get them by law, you have to kill all of the fish and there's no rec- you know, recompense. You're basically killing, you know, maybe hundreds of thousands of animals because of disease. So there is a very big push and a lot of funding for disease work. Of course, disease is only part of animal welfare. Um, the other parts of animal welfare are, are the animals actually in good condition when, in fact, you know, they might be um, exhibiting things like fin erosion and have sores on them. And um, in the salmon industry, there's a real problem with sea lice where the, the sea lice are parasites which burrow into the skin and leave huge big holes in the salmon. And, and I think the, the aquaculture industry want to get rid of diseases and they will um, happily fund a lot of money, you know, fund, sorry, a lot of research and pile money into that kind of, that type of welfare. But when you try and talk to them about, environmental enrichment and about um, actually providing the animals with more space to move or a more naturalistic environment, they are less receptive because they think this might cost us money and um, we don't we don't want to lose money, we don't want to spend money on this. And so I think now they're, they're starting to change their minds and um, there's been a quite a few studies looking at uh, sea bass sea cages where if you just put simple ropes in actually the animals were much better welfare less aggression less fin erosion they use more of the cage um, so they were less anxious and if you go with with scientific studies like that you can actually show them actually these were just you know ropes and that was it you know and that's so simple to put in place it's cheap um, but there is kind of more of a, a fixation on disease rather than welfare as a whole thank you um, Carly, I would expect that it'd be the opposite for you, like compa- that people owning pets would care a lot more about their welfare than people care about like agriculture, for example. Am I, am I right in that assumption? So I think, uh, I mean, if you think about the way that the term welfare is used, um, by pet owners and the veterinary industry. I think it's used differently than the way that we think about it. Um, so I think it's just a, um, I don't want to say a lack of knowledge, but I think there's a different understanding because we've had so much education in this area and work in this field that, you know, the average person just doesn't have. So for pet owners, I think it's definitely different. Um, the veterinary industry, um, I know you know, they're so important in protecting animal welfare and educating pet owners on animal welfare, but I really see a lack of animal welfare education at the vet school level, um, particularly little focus on behavior training. Um, so being able to read behavior what, and interpreting what it means. Um, there's very little focus on housing um, and management of companion animals at the vet school level. And so I think if the veterinarians are the primary ones that are educating pet owners on these different things, that's sort of an area that needs to change. Um, And like, for example, here, I think the students only receive one week of behavior training. One behavior is so important. Um, For example, in in identifying pain in animals, we know behavior is so important. Um, And so I think that needs, really needs to change. And I don't even, know if they receive any, what does animal welfare mean type training. I think a lot of the industry sees animal welfare, they use that term very loosely and it's used for physical health and functioning. So um, biological functioning. So I think it's used in a different way than that we use it. Thank you, Uh, that's super interesting. Uh, Sarah, I honestly have no idea about your your industry so um I don't even know what to expect so please uh yeah we're very excited to hear your perspectives on all this because I feel like when we had a discussion about the panel every time we were like I wonder about the wildlife industry yeah yeah 
So I would say if you look at wildlife as an industry, where is wildlife found within industries? There's several different areas. So we farm wildlife. We keep them in captivity and they're there for production and whether it's for fur or hide or antlers or meat, uh, wildlife is farmed. Wildlife is also used in captivity. So for entertainment purposes, zoological purposes, you know, aquariums, that type of industry itself is very different. And then of course you have free living wildlife conservation and wildlife management. And they're two very different uh, areas. Um, so I would say those who are working in um, farming wildlife, of course, are focused on biological functioning. Those who are working with animals in captivity for the purpose of uh, entertainment or conservation, you know, are focused on biological activity, but are much more aware of also um, behavior um, and trying to address, you know, situations of keeping animals healthy through uh, behavioral means in, in captive environments. And a lot of research and work has been done in that area, of course, in the last couple of decades with, with captive wildlife. But then the, the term wildlife to wildlife managers is, is still uncertain. You know, they didn't even have that word in their vocabulary 20 years ago. So, um, you know, when you're conducting wildlife research, yes, you've had to go through animal care committees through universities. And so some of those researchers, you know, are, are more aware of, of what wildlife um, and, and, you know, and what is their welfare, but all, but it's still, we're still working on the wildlife biologists. Um, it, you know, they could really use a course as well, just like the veterinarians in, in <laughs> animal welfare in, in their programs. So yeah, it, it's still work because I think wildlife biologists are like, you know, they, they understand the naturalistic, like wild animals should have natural lives. Um, but the problem is, is that biological functioning and, and behavior can suffer as a result of um, just that focus and, and um, you know, you know, just because, you know, an animal's life is wild doesn't necessarily mean they're free from suffering. That's very that is caused by humans, right? So yes, there's natural suffering, natural reasons, but there's also a lot of human factors. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I guess that kind of brings us into um, the next question. Um, we kind of covered, you guys kind of covered like the goals of each of your industries. So we're going to move on to um, the main stakeholders and funders of your research. So um, if you could kind of give an outline on, and, and I'm sure some of you like, like we've covered may talk about multiple different industries and that that is totally fine. Please give us the nuance here. But um, what are the main stakeholders and funders of your research and why? Um, and do animals often get forgotten or are they often a main stakeholder in their own welfare? Um, let's start with um, Cassandra. Yeah, so right now in my research program, I have funding from USDA, so government, government based funding. And I also have funding from the California Energy Commission. Um, it's kind of an unusual source, but they've been funding, I have funding for them from them for the last few years. And they've been funding work that I've been doing looking at ways to cool cattle. Um, and they're interested in efficiency of water and energy use. Um, so we've partnered. Um, for an, uh, several projects on California dairy farms. Not ever had money from the dairy industry the whole time I've been in California, um, which is very different than how it was when That's I- That's so interesting. I worked, I worked in Canada and in New Zealand and, and there you know, the, the, the dairy producers were more actively at the, at the table in terms of funding my research. Um, but I would say they are one of my main stakeholders, um, both the cows and the, and they're, they're one of the primary, you know, one of my primary audiences in terms of who I hope will uptake and, and use the knowledge um, that I generate. And there I have very good engagement, I would say, but it just doesn't, it doesn't translate in terms of, in terms of funding. Do you find the public um, is a huge stakeholder in that, or do you find the knowledge translation doesn't really get to the public and you're not really in conversation with the general public about welfare? I would say that general public is not part of my target audience, um, that I am very interested in the supply chain um, and very much looking at and engaging, I hope to be engaging with um, key decision makers. So where there's basically large you know, purchasers of agricultural products 
um, but at a at a very high high level, um, that their interest in animal welfare and and trying to create assurance for then the the broader public um, is they're really important decision makers and and influencers in in how how the supply chain you know in in the supply chain and and how how things are functioning. What what kind of assurance are they asking for in terms of what happens on farm? And, and in this way, like because there's a lot of you know essentially power and money concentrated, I, I find them to be a more strategic, a more strategic audience and stakeholder be to be engaging with than to try to reach 330 million Americans. <laughs> like it, <laughs> but totally. I, I can I can achieve much more by working with a very small group of people that are very targeted and have a lot of influence over how how food moves. Um, yeah, wonderful. Thank you. A more realistic audience. I understand that for sure. Um, Joanna, what are your thoughts on that with laboratory animals? First, I want to say I really appreciate seeing the pets on screens. <laughs> I know. I was just going to comment on it. I was like, kitty cat. <laughs> I know. And there's a dog. And, okay. um, <laughs> so it's an interesting, actually, it's an interesting thing with lab animals because I think the research, biomedical research industry is non-transparent. I think the public knows very little about what actually happens. But in reality, they are the main funders and they are the main stakeholders. Um, most research is funded, like in Canada, at least it's funded um, through taxpayer money, right? So we're the ones funding it, but no idea really what happens. And we're the ones who benefit from it. I mean, the goal is to advance science and medications and things like that. Um, so we're supposed to be both the payers and the benefactors, um, but have very little say into what happens and even whether that money goes towards that often you know you'll you'll give money to the cancer society because you want to be cancer but don't really think that that's going towards biomedical research necessarily um, in terms of my own work so with lab animal welfare research that too is funded mainly by taxpayer money um, so same kind of grants as other researchers get um, and then there's like a much 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 smaller pool that comes from animal welfare organizations that that will get some funding. Awesome. And related to that, would you say that often animals are brought up as a stakeholder in their own welfare, or do you think typically it's the the research and other things that are are? It's an interesting question. I think animals are brought up as benefit, like as as benefiting from this research mainly. To, ad, to advocate for research. So researchers will often say, well, this helps animals too. Um, but you hear that a lot in the public statements to kind of garner support for this type of research more than I feel on the field when you're a researcher. Um, it's the humans. It's, I mean, they're there to benefit humans mostly. Um, so yeah, it's, they're often used as a stakeholder, oh, but totally not so fair. much. Yeah, it's an interesting. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Sarah, what are your perspectives on that when it comes to wildlife welfare and whether or not these animals are stakeholders in their own welfare on top of that and funders and, and that kind of stuff? Yeah, I, I don't think wildlife are considered stakeholders because a lot of people say, you know, you can't own wildlife. You know, unfortunately, it's, there are some pets that are kept as well, you know, um, wild, wild animals kept as pets, but um, hopefully that's, a, you know, a trend that we see declining. But in reality, I think most people think that wild animals should exist just for themselves and, and that they um, don't necessarily have welfare because, you know, they're not in captivity, the majority of them, right? So the five freedoms don't necessarily apply in the same sense that they would for animals that are under the care of, of people. So um, when it comes to funding, you know, there are, of course, donors and foundations that fund work from nonprofit organizations. There is taxpayers' dollars going into wildlife research that's done by institutions uh, across Canada. But um, there's very limited, and this will vary, I think, in, in different international contexts, um, funding from hunting or trapping or guide outfitting organizations. So there is some wildlife research that is funded, uh, and you can see the direct tie. They're, they're funding work that's being done on species that they're quite interested in harvesting at some point. And so that is um, an interesting dilemma. Um, but overall, wildlife research funding, I think, would be at a much, much smaller scale than some of the other industries that we're, we're talking about today. Yes, absolutely. I think probably Carly can maybe relate to that a bit more, too. Do you want to talk about 
that Carly in terms of funding for um, companion animals, but then also whether or not they're considered stakeholders in their own welfare? Right, yeah, I think funding, funding for companion animals is challenging. <laughs> Um, it's largely from nonprofits and it really comes from interest in the veterinary industry and shelter um, industries. I think it's really challenging to do any type of research on companion animals in their home environment and relates to sort of how they're managed, resources provided, that kind of thing, because it's really hard. No one wants to fund that, um, even though that's where pets spend most of their time is at their, in their home. <laughs> Um, usually to, to get any type of funding, you need to tie it back to the veterinary industry, uh, you know, really focusing on that physical health and functioning. If you do have behavior, you need to add some sort of physiological parameters, really tie it back to health for people that sort of take you seriously and to actually, um, can, you know, have them consider you for funding. And then the other way would be to go through shelter. So reducing relinquishment, behavior problems reduce time to adoption, increase number of pets that can be adopted, that kind of thing. So I think those are the two avenues for funding, but it's, we're really missing that, that, that portion of where pets are in their home, because who's gonna fund that? Um, so that's kind of challenging. So we have a lot of nonprofits that give little tiny chunks of money. <laughs> um, and yes, yeah, so the main stakeholders I would say is the veterinary industry, animal shelters, um, I think pet owners, but again, it's hard to get funding. It's nice that we can do questionnaire type research with pet owners because it's very cheap to do. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think those would be the main stakeholders. Um, yeah, totally. I was also going to ask, you kind of touched on this too, but I find it, it is easier to tie it back to human health sometimes if there are behavioral issues like aggression that kind of tie back to human health. Do you find that that is an easier way to get funding or an easier way to engage people if you relate it to human health and safety or human right. happiness, like human animal bond kind of things? Yeah, so that's another way to get funding is to tie it back to how it impacts public health. Um, and so it really focuses, I think it kind of turns, because I'm really interested in the animals, but I know human animal interactions for me are very, very important. And then for those types of research, it, it kind of sometimes does focus more on how does this impact the human um, service animal research, for example. And then there's little research about, oh, what about the impact of that industry on the actual animal, you know, being a service animal. Um, and so I am less interested in that because it's just so human focused, but I do understand the real, the importance there. And I think, yeah, the NIH has partnered with some, um, I want to say like Waltham, um, uh, like a pet company and, um, you can get research, you can get grants that do look at sort of service animals, human animal bond, but it's very focused on how does it benefit, the, benefit the person, not so much, um, the impact on the, on the animal. Yeah, thank you. That's really interesting. Um, Lynn, what about from an, an aquaculture perspective? Again, I um, similar to wildlife, I have no perspective on what people might see as stakeholders in, in aquaculture. And I doubt they're seen as stakeholders in their own welfare, but please correct me if I'm wrong there. Yeah, um, so funding wise, I mainly, well, most of my money's come from um, funding bodies that are funded by public, the public's taxes. Um, so very much like Joanna and Cassandra, it's really, um, large scale funding bodies such as the EU, the European Union or um, Swedish funding bodies at the moment or, um, or animal welfare charities who fund science. Um, the aquaculture industry, I've never had money from them. I don't, don't know that they ever would fund me, um, but they tend to fund work on animal disease, on fish diseases. They don't tend to fund work so much in the field of pure animal welfare. Um, so stakeholder wise, um, yeah, they sh the aquaculture industry should be very interested in improving the welfare of their animals, um, but they tend to invest more in the animal disease side. Um, and certainly um, the public should be very interested in this because they eat fish or they keep fish as a pet. Or um, if you're a scientist, you do experiments on fish. And in Europe, fish are the second most used mo animal model now. We use more fish than rats in Europe. Uh, in experiments and so there, there's kind of a, a, a kind of complex issue surrounding fish depending on how you see them and something touched upon at the start when you know if you see them as a foodstuff um, you might be interested in their welfare because you want them to 
be disease free and had a healthy, happy life before you eat them. Or it may be that you're interested in, in um, large scale fisheries and sustainability of populations. And, and so that can be you know, quite an important issue. Many people want to eat sustainable products that come from sustainable fisheries. And that's very difficult at the moment. And um, then there's the practice of catch and release angling, you know, when individuals do um, the catching of animals for a hobby or a sport. And of course, um, the anglers, as we call them anglers, I don't know what you call them, fishers, um, they want to catch healthy animals and they want those stocks to be sustainable when they go out to the lakes or the rivers, they want to be able to catch animals. Then, of course, um, fish are actually third most popular pet. So lots of people get fish, put them in their homes and they want them to be in good condition. And so, you know, they really love their pet fish, but often people can do it without any idea of, of how to keep a fish. And then, of course, there's public aquaria that want, you know, they have these very expensive fishes, like they have sharks that are worth 23,000 euros. I don't know how much that's in dollars. But, you know, they, they want these fish to be healthy, you know, 4,000 pound grouper. Um, they want this animal to be really healthy and look beautiful. So when people pay a lot of money to look at them. So it's, there's actually the public's quite important, I think, in terms of driving fish welfare. But it is kind of complicated by what the kind of relationship you have with them. Yeah, that's super interesting. It's really interesting with the um, aquaculture as pets perspective, because I feel like people would, similar to companion animals, perhaps rely on the vet, but I think there are many, many vets that have no experience in aquaculture or any kind of exotic animals. And so people are kind of left to their own devices in terms of welfare of their of their pet fish and relying yeah. perhaps on pet stores that have sold them this fish or, or other things like that. Um, yeah. Do you find that's the experience? Although I know you don't work with pets, but yeah, I mean, I, I have done quite a bit of work on um, ornamental species like guppies and clownfish, um, but actually um, most people can't afford to take their one, you know, one dollar guppy to the vet. They just can't afford it. And so there's a lot of products that you can buy in the pet store and treat the fish themselves if you have the knowledge. Um, but I think um, I train vets at Liverpool and I, I, you know, I train vets across Europe. And, you know, it's a bit sad, really, at Liverpool. They got three hours of lectures and there's something like 35,000 species of fish. And then one practical, we did a post-mortem to find out why the fish had died. So it's a bit sad, really. It's, you know, they maybe got a maximum of six hours exposure during a, in, in a five-year program um, to fishes. Um, I think there is a greater need for fish vets, certainly in terms of laboratory fish welfare, uh, because fish have become so prominent as a model. Um, and, it, you know, people do love their pet fish. Um, and I, I think they, there would be... There could be a greater demand from the public, but it's I think the cost is the thing that, that is prohibitive, really. I think people see it as a, a cheap pet to have, too. So the cost doesn't really mm -hmm. outweigh the benefit of, of that. That's very interesting. Thank you. Um, Anna, would, or Anna, would you like to move on to the next question? Uh, yeah, that's actually uh, perfect, Lynn. You've, you've just um, touched upon our, our next question. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on what are the biggest obstacles or challenges that you face when you're communicating your research findings or trying to implement changes to improve the welfare of, of fish? Yeah, I think in terms of um, the aquaculture industry, I think they are pro-welfare if it means they're going to make money. And so you have to sell it to them as being, look, this is going to increase productivity. The animals are going to be healthier. They're going to grow more. They're going to get less disease. So if you implement this welfare improvement, then, then you will make more money. And, and that's the way to really sell it. And I'm sorry to be so cynical, but you know my experience over the last 20 or so years. Um, in terms of research, because I work a lot with research models like zebrafish, um, there is actually, a, there's kind of, there's become two kinds of kind of zebrafish research so there's a, there's many of them I know who are very pro animal welfare want to know the latest information on enrichment and on water quality and and you know um, sort of behavioral management strategies and then there's the other kind who see zebrafish as a chemical on a shelf and they don't particularly want to make many changes or any changes to the way that they're doing things because these are kind of these are like scientific pots on it sitting on a shelf and so why would you give them what enrichment and why would you 
manage them and give them dusk and dawn and why would you give them you know um food enrichment and and so there is a kind of resistance there and a barrier to trying to get these people on board and say actually you'll have a better scientific animal if you if that animal has better welfare um so yeah i think most of the people in public aquaria are totally on board with um you know, positive welfare and, and do strive to get vets involved and, you know, they have vet inspections and, you know, they do want their animals to be in great welfare. So I tend to find they're very proactive when it comes to fish welfare. Thank you. Um, Joanna, do you have similar experiences with laboratory rats as Lynn has been describing with, with the um, laboratory fish? Yeah, I think a lot of the time, very much the animals are tools to achieve an outcome. So they're kind of, a lot of people look at, well, almost saying that the animal, it lives in a vacuum, like the environment is not a factor, but you're not realizing that a barren environment is a huge factor. Um, I'd say the biggest barrier to improving welfare and interest in improving welfare there is the concerns of how this will impact the science. And so we know 100% if you improve their environment, make it more natural or improve effective states, the results are going to be different a lot of the times. But then the question becomes, but is it better science? Um, even if you kind of show that it is, which is it's often hard to show, people are still weary because, well, it costs more money to achieve. And you know what? We've always done it this way. Now, if we continue doing it this way, we can build upon um, so many years of research. So if you change, it's almost like you start with a new baseline. So that is a huge barrier that we're finding on top of having to pay more money often. Oh, wow, thank you. I did not even consider that. That makes a lot of sense though. Um, Cassandra, can you add something about, about your industry and the obstacles that you face when trying to implement um, measures to improve welfare in, in cattle? Yeah, I think that the pattern I notice is that it, it has a lot to do with how much is in, included. <laughs> um, I know that may sound kind of vague, but I mean, basically my experience is that we encounter that people have, have different kind of blind spots about, about what is or is not included. Um, and you know, we were we were touching on this earlier in the in the panel in terms of like looking at topic areas about what whether there's an emphasis on biological functioning or the physical health of the animal or so on. But I, I guess I would say for me that the the bigger pattern is is that is whether or not there's a, a the topic or the the area that we're looking to extend knowledge about whether or not that's included in the person's perspective. Um, so maybe I can give you a quick example um, that a few a few years ago, um, we in the national program that we use with for dairy cattle here in the U.S. Um, it involves an on-farm assessment, and um, a few years ago we tried to include broken tails um, as a one of the um, animal-based outcomes that was going to be measured um, as part of the program, and. People went out and they looked and they they did the evaluations and they came back to us as the as the technical writing committee and said these broken tails this isn't a problem this isn't something that, that occurs on farms we can drop it and so we did we actually dropped it from the next iteration of the program um, and then we went out in a, and in a more concentrated way and on a small about 400 farms we went and looked in more detail and we found lots of broken tails. Um, some farms with no problems at all, but other farms where every every cow was affected that we looked at. Um, and so now it's it's back in the program. People are looking at it in a more in a, in a in a deeper way, and we're having a lot of conversations about broken tails. So it it wasn't in, until we kind of create this opening that it, that something it goes from being like in a blind spot into into something that we see. That's and that, that there's many things that exist back here out of out of view um and that when when it's back here it's very hard to achieve change and 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 to have things taken up it, it has to somehow come into the to, to be on the table for discussion where multiple people are seeing it that that's that's when i find that that things move thank you um 
I I feel like there might be some uh, correlations to the the whole keel bone fracture issue in in laying hands. Um, I'm a chicken person, so that's why that just popped up in my head when you said that. <laughs> Fairly similar process there. Um, so Carla, you talked already about vets and, and the, the lack of, of uh, education about animal welfare and behavior at vet school. Um, are these the main obstacles that you're facing or are there other things that are standing in your way of implementing um, measures? I think that's a, I think it's one of the major huge obstacles um, to get first interest in behavior and welfare, they need to be introduced to it <laughs> in school. And um, also not, it, I think it's seen as this very fluffy thing um, because they're so focused on biological functioning, measure, you know, disease, um, treatment. Um, and that's sort of seen as more rigorous or more important. Um, and I think maybe trying to connect behavior and welfare to biological health and functioning would really help. Um, and might get more interest and have the industry a little bit more serious um, about it. Um, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely challenging. Um, I think another big issue is knowledge translation. We have all, you know, we have a lot more research coming out in companion animal behavior and welfare, but who's actually receiving this information so that they can actually apply it. So that's like a gap, I think, in getting this knowledge out to veterinarians and clinics who are handling cats. Um, there's, you know, so many of them, it's such a huge industry, pet owners, getting them aware of um, various things that may help reduce behavior problems or reduce agonistic interactions between their cats. Um, so I think knowledge translation is another huge obstacle and. Um, I, for at least for the veterinary industry, I think the fear free program and um, programs like that, where I, I found more and more people working in the veterinary industry are knowing about the fear free program, taking the fear free program, and there's the shelter for veterinary, there's different ones, even one for um, pet owners now. Um, and so I think those types of programs really help. It's just, it's too bad that they all cost money. <laughs> Um, cause there, there's another barrier. So, um, cause this, this knowledge that's so important is not freely accessible, um, to, to the average person. A lot of veterinarians don't, you know, work in science, they work in clinics. And so accessing the literature, interpreting the literature, it's just something that's very challenging. Um, and I get comments about that in papers, um, back from veterinary journals saying, you know, this statistical write-up is way too complicated. How are veterinarians supposed to interpret this? If we can't understand it, you shouldn't have it in there type of thing. And it, it's, so it's very challenging. Um, so that's, yeah, another big obstacle. Do you find it easier to um, talk to or reach pet owners or vets or are there different obstacles between the, the different groups? I think they're both very interested in it. They just don't know how to access it um, without maybe going to a conference or doing that fear free program. I think like the accessibility um, of the knowledge is a huge issue. Um, Cause I do like cat owners are extremely interested. Um, we had a recent survey looking at cat um, behaviors in the home and we had 7,000 responses within a couple of days and like everyone's emailing us all these, oh, you know, we love this. And like telling us stories of their cats, sending pictures. Like I think there's that engagement and that is there. Um, it's trying to figure out a, the best way to sort of provide them with the knowledge that they want and um, that would be very helpful for their pets at home. Thank you. Um, Sarah, what, what are the obstacles that, that you are facing or are you, is it different obstacles for the different like uh, parts of, of wildlife uh, welfare? Yeah, so I think obviously, you know, captive wildlife and free living wildlife, we can look at both of those areas. But Carly reminded me of uh, a journal reviewer once uh, told me, so this was a natural resource uh, journal, and they said that animal welfare is not a science. Um, so I think fundamentally, <laughs> we still have challenges um, in getting that knowledge um, that animal welfare is a science where the quality of life can be measured. Um, to wildlife biologists is, is fundamental because the 
I think the core issue, whether it's captive or free living wildlife, is that it's perceived as a resource. And so wild animals are there for humans to use in whatever context um, we, we like. And um, that animals who are free living, um, you know, experience suffering, but that's natural. You know, it, um, I think it was Hem Temple Grandin, of course, who said, you know, nature can be cruel, but we don't have to be. And so there are so many circumstances where wild animals, um, people interact with wild animals. And I think that that is fundamental, the shift of the resource to where Indigenous scholars will say that wild animals are relations. And so if we can look more from that lens, I think that would be really fundamental to shifting attitudes um, for wildlife in the context of animal welfare. And I'll just say that one of my biggest challenges is social media. <laughs> like social media has done a really poor job of um, interacting with wild animals, people, whether it's through tourism, or animals in captivity or um, you know, other activities, but that is actually, I think, leading to uh, a kind of swing of, of, of wild animals being perceived as, you know, things that they're not. Wow, thank you. I, uh, I did not consider that, but that makes a lot of sense. Hmm. Um, wow, yeah, obviously, I guess, now that I think about it. <laughs> I think also it's interesting because social media, you'd think it have also such a positive impact in certain ways, getting yeah. education out there, but because it's uncensored and there's little way to tell who is educated and who is not and who is just speaking with confidence, it can be very difficult to weed through the mass information and, and photos can go viral very easily and those kinds of things. So that's such a mm -hmm. interesting topic. The Tiger King, this is, is oh. a, an example of, yeah, yeah, yeah. of uh, you know, what media does to the perception yeah. of wildlife. Do you find that there's a lot of misinformation being shared on social media yes. that is really in your way? <laughs> yeah, guess. feeding wildlife, interacting with wildlife, photos with wildlife, all those kinds yeah. of things, um, unfortunately, are, are problematic for their welfare. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right. Can I add? Yeah, yeah, I have seen here. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that I think that some of the things Sarah's saying too about this uh, relationship also, like in, in terms of like the distance between the person and the, the animal or the, even the, the, the distance between the two people. <laughs> um, and I mean, like relational distance, I, I think has a, has a lot to do with whether or not, whether or not something changes that, um, but in many of the cases, like a lot of the, the things that we're talking about in terms of education or even the programs that Carly was naming, like a lot of those things, like they involve people interacting with people. And, and that, that to me, that's, that's the crucible where change happens is when people connect. Um, and that this is, I think, part of also what can happen with social media is that although maybe it's touted sometimes as being bringing people closer together, it actually can just amplify like what is already a part. Um, and yeah, that I, I, I think that, you know, we, the, the question was framed kind of in terms of what are challenges about, but I think when I, we flip it around and say, what are opportunities for, for um, deepening conversations about animal welfare? I think that happens between people and, and the closer that we can get like on the farm or in terms of providing support and connection and that, starting to look at these, these issues, especially if they're really a foreign or unfamiliar or alien, that, 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 that it only becomes less so by, by, kind of by, by talking with, with others and that we, that we do better work together. I love that you flipped that around with the opportunities because I think that also goes back to what um, Carly was saying about accessibility is a huge issue, which is why I'm so interested in science communication. And I think why a lot of people are so interested in it is because what's the point of science if you can't actually push the information out to the people who need it? And why do we have all of these paywalls where um, all of the scientific information can't actually get through to people or even people who don't have the resources can't get through to pay for fear free and, and can't get those extra resources. So I think that's such an interesting topic too of how we how do we make things more accessible and understandable. Yeah. All right. Um, was that everyone on us? Should I move on to the next question? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay. 
Um, yeah, so I guess kind of going off of that, you might have already covered it, so feel free to just kind of add a few things on, but um, we were interested in what you think the most important factors when considering animal welfare in your species are and what a positive welfare state might look like in an individual. So um, what are those things that we could be looking for, not necessarily just absence of suffering, but what are those behaviors that we might want to look for or what are those positive welfare states that we could be looking for in terms of really moving everything into a different direction. Um, and Lynn, do you want to start us off? I know that's kind of <laughs> throwing you into the deep end with the fish, but um, I, I'm so interested in your perspective on this and if there if there is a way that we can start looking at positive welfare in fish. Yeah, certainly. I think um, and I've sort of spent a lot of time watching videos of fish and um, looking at both sort of negative welfare states and then you know the kind of um, animals which are undisturbed and appear to be in a good welfare state and you know I can certainly say a healthy zebra fish is constantly swimming it's interacting with its tank mates it's eating really readily it's um, swimming in amongst enrichment that we put in the tank and then when you go to um, siphon some water out it's coming up and being inquisitive and um, certainly you know sort of attacking the um the siphon as if it's an intruder in its environment and having worked with rainbow trout for a long time um these are an aquaculture species kept in aquaculture in huge densities you know something like uh, it's always given as a stocking density of 15 kilograms per meter squared which is a huge amount of fish in a small space um, but actually i i often keep um rainbow trout on their own because they're actually a territorial species and um, we just had an, uh, an experiment running where um, the fish actually tripled in size and they were sitting in their own tank with their enrichment and getting fed every day and great water quality. And, you know, they're swimming around and, and it's very difficult though, to try and avoid being anthropomorphic about it and say they looked happy. But, you know, the fact that they, you know, they were growing really well and they looked great and the fact that they're not having to engage with others in, in aggressive interactions and be bitten or, you know, suffer fin erosion. Um, actually, when you keep that the species like rainbow trout on its own, it really flourishes. And so there are, I think, indicators of positive welfare in fishies, but it's very much species specific. And, and you have to really take into account the, the sort of life history and behavioral ecology of each species. Totally, that definitely makes sense. I'm sure, um, Sarah, you can also relate to everything is probably very species specific, but also I'm sure captivity versus um, living in the wild, very different in, uh, maybe not indicators of positive welfare, but indicators that we can see and what might indicate that an animal is in a positive state of welfare. Absolutely, yeah. Species specific and, you know, the captive environment will always introduce negative welfare factors, no matter how good that captive environment is. Um, you know, if it's a sanctuary style captivity, you know, there are still challenges um, with that, that animal state. Um, for animals in the wild, of course, we would say that, you know, a natural life um, would be the ideal for their welfare. But sometimes, again, you know, there are very few environments where wild animals actually can have a, a life free of human influence. And so that's, um, you know, whether it's climate change or, um, you know, roads or air pollution, all these other things that we introduce, you know, wild animals are having fewer and fewer opportunities to have a purely natural life. So I think that that's that's the challenge um, is, is, is protecting them <laughs> as, as much as we can from our, from our actions. Yeah, that's very interesting that you bring up um, the challenges of um, human, in, in, like human interactions in the wild, but also I'm, I'm sure people give the argument that, like we said earlier, nature is cruel and how do we necessarily mitigate those welfare factors or do we mitigate just the factors that we are involved in and those are the ones that we can kind of know about and do anything about. Yeah, so we always look at it, of course, as like direct and indirect influences. And there are many indirect influences that we have that are harder to change because they're system wide type activities rather than, you know, the, um, some of the direct things like, you know, hitting an animal with your car, we can reduce speed limits, those kinds of um, mitigation strategies. But it, it is challenging to address some of the bigger um, global in, indirect issues, of course. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I'm sure, um, Joanna, you can speak to captivity, obviously, but also species differences. I'm sure you focus on specific ones, but in terms of laboratory animals, I'm sure there's a wide range of, of positive welfare states. But could you speak to specifically your experiences with um, positive welfare states in, in laboratory animals? Yeah, I mean, there's absolutely huge species differences. Uh, I focus a lot on rats. So if I had to say, what does a happy rat look like? the main thing that comes to mind is one that is busy um, because you go into a lab with rats and and it's the dark period and they're supposed to be active and doing things and they do nothing they're just sitting there um, and that's not good so you want to see a rat that goes about their day they're organizing their space they're hoarding you want to see bounding behavior so they have positive states um, for a macaque that would look very different um, and a macaque like having outdoor housing with a lot of things. I think busy in general probably <laughs> applies to many species actually. Um, I think boredom, anxiety, depression are common. Um, captivity is an issue. I mean, there's questions, is there such a thing as comfortable captivity? And again, I think that's species dependent. It's easier to give to a more domesticated species than a wild one for sure. Um, so it is possible. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to stop there for now. <laughs> no, that's totally okay. Thank you. It's interesting that you bring up busy too, because I think a lot of people also talk about, oh, absence of stereotypic behaviors means positive welfare. But then I've also heard, heard the opposite of perhaps stereotypic behaviors are actually mitigating some depression issues that could arise from lack of movement. Right. And then you can all, you also have to differentiate between stereotypic behaviors and using enrichments and doing natural behaviors and stuff like yeah. that. So it's very complicated. And it's true that, so mice are, do a lot of stereotypy. So in, 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 not, in an environment where they're not doing super well, you go into the lab in the dark period and it's loud and everybody's doing stereotypy. So it's very different from the rat. Um, although you do have some mice that do the inactive put awake. So it's a little different with mice, but part of what he mentioned, but I think agency having choice is key. Um, making choice about your life, how you live it, where you go, who you associate with, which is a huge issue in lab animals because most of the time you're stuck with one or three if you're mouse individuals for your entire life and that's it like you don't get to choose um, and we know of free-ranging colonies where these associations change over time um, and relationships change and that's you know basic thing that we never give them the choice about yeah that's very interesting the agency thing um carly do you want to talk about um in terms of um pets and companions i think a lot of people would automatically assume more positive welfare states, but actually perhaps there's a lack of knowledge there and it really depends on the species and the individual. So do you wanna to speak to that? Yeah, I think choice is also really important for companion animals living in a home environment. So it does depend what type of environment you're talking about. Um, but in the home, they should have a safe spot to get away from kids in the house, get away from other animals in the house, um, you know, a place to sleep access to resources, you know, so there's no other animal blocking their resources. Um, I think that's really important in their own space. There can be a lot of issues in multi pet um, households, um, especially if it's, you know, a smaller um, place with lots of animals. So like, a, you know, someone has four cats and they live in a, con a small condo or something like that. So I think thinking about how the animals are managed and um, resources provided, um, having their own space, is really, really important and maybe not considered as much as it should be. Um, and so for positive welfare, yeah, it's be, you know, freely interacting with other animals when they want to and sort of leaving those interactions when it gets too much or they need their own time. Um, you see that a lot in um, multi-cat households, uh, being able to access resources, um, uh, interacting with the owner um, and approaching that kind of thing. Um, I think it's definitely very different when you think about welfare in a veterinary clinic setting. Um, so that's definitely more challenging. Can animals have good welfare at the vet clinic? I don't know. Um, it's a very stressful environment. It's a new environment. Cats generally don't, you know, aren't exposed to a lot of different environments. They're not as socialized as dogs. Maybe if you have a young cat that's well socialized, it might be different. But in general, they are. It's quite a stressful place to be. So usually we think about reducing negative um, 
things in the environment, improving handling, um, that kind of thing. So I think that's definitely, I don't know if cats can have good welfare um, in a vet clinic, um, but it's, you know, short term usually stays. Um, shelter environments, it's, I think it's focused, a lot of focus is on the housing. So approaching the front of the cage when someone comes up, I think is good. Eating, drinking, having a place to hide, um, perch, performs, you know, highly motivated behaviors, being able to scratch, stretch, stand, turn, you know, so there's a lot of different things um, we can look for um, adopted quickly. <laughs> and usually those cats who look more comfortable at the animal shelter will be adopted more a little bit more quickly. So yeah, it depends yeah. on the environment. No, those are great points. Um, I think also it, it you touched on how um, interactions with other animals and the amount of other animals in the space and amount and ability to get away. I think probably that's something, um, Cassandra, you can talk about because I'm sure stocking densities and those kinds of things probably um, and and even social dynamics in in larger herds or or larger agricultural groups probably can be an issue when when talking about welfare and like how might you go about assessing positive welfare states in a large group of animals? I mean, I think that, yeah, my, I mean, my attention definitely goes to, I mean, one thinking about the, the health of the animals as we were talking about earlier, but also then thinking about their physical, their physical environment. Um, and I think for cattle, for dairy cattle, that would mean having access, you know, being able to so agency, like to be able to get off concrete, um, opportunities to groom, opportunities to eat fibrous food. So that involves using the tongue and the mouth and, and you know, very similar to some of the things we were talking about before about it being species specific, but for ruminants that I think this is very important. Um, and also looking at their social environment, both their interactions with humans, but also you know, same age animals, um, their ability to form stable relationships um, with conspecifics or other 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 cows, um, and then also with across the ages in terms of contact with calves, calves having social contact with each other, but also with adults. Um, whether or not, I mean, I find positive effective state very difficult to study. <laughs> so I, I I think that there's we have a strong emphasis on mitigating the negative ones for good reason. Um, one, because those are things that are, you know, there many of, it, we tend to look at it from the challenge perspective, I think, um, or at least I, I tend to anyway. Um, and also because I think it's, I, I think it's difficult to, to know. Um, and so, I, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I, I mean, I think in general, it's a good place to start probably. Um, so always mitigating the negative things is always probably where we're going to start. But um, it's nice to see some some focus on positive things and, and working towards it. But obviously, it's such a difficult thing to measure that um, it can be tricky, that, especially in large, in large groups of animals. And then even even that even that I can look at it from the the lens of mitigating negative states, and I might come up with the exact same list of of what what makes a, a really good environment for a cow. So totally. Maybe maybe it matters. Maybe it's more about semantics in in some ways. Um, Yes, absolutely. I totally agree with you. Thank you. Um, well, this will move on to um, kind of an interesting question. I'm very interested in your guys' perspective, but I know there will not be um, a universal answer to this. And I think it's um, it's a very tricky topic in, in general, probably in humans as well. Um, but how important and relevant is the idea of individual animal consent when it comes to industry practices and animal welfare research? And um, what is your approach to assessing or obtaining it? And I know some of you won't have an approach and that's okay. How, how would you assess it? Um, give us your thoughts in general, I think. Um, um, we'll start with uh, Carly um, and then we'll, we'll work our way over, hopefully. <laughs> oh, Carly, you're muted still. That's okay. We'll we'll move okay. on to someone else. And we'll come back to Carly. I can't hear what she's saying. Um, Cassandra, do you want to do you want to talk about this? Um, yeah. So I mean, I I I don't 
I don't think I, I don't get consent from the cows <laughs> and I don't think that they consent to, to being on, on the farm. I, I don't know. I, <laughs> the, so the organizers gave us these questions in, in, in advance. And this was one that I <laughs> had a lot of, did a lot of thinking about, about even just about what is consent and, and what do we mean? Um, yeah. It was meant to stump you. It wasn't meant to be <laughs> an well, easy no, question by far. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, and I think um, with consent too, it it could come from do we do we start doing more practices and things where we can see a choice, where we can see um, we can give them a choice and allow them to choose something and see that as a type of consent, um, or in, possibly in terms of Carly's maybe guardians can consent for their animals, but do you see maybe like milking machines like the ones where they go in automatically to do that? Would you can see that? consider that possibly a type of consent compared to bringing cows into milking machines on specific times? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think for sure that when the animals make choices that that's, that's really valuable information. And that I think, I think some of the evidence, for example, we've done some work looking at animals choosing pain relief, for example, that that, that generates some of the most powerful evidence that we have that it's valuable to them. Uh, but maybe that, I'm not sure if that's exactly the same as, as what you're asking about. No, totally. I, I think it's such a nuanced question. Thank you so much. Um, can we jump back to Carly or are you, I can ask you to unmute, I think. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, no, no problem at all. I'm glad we got it figured out. I'm gonna pin you again. There you go. <laughs> Okay, sorry, I literally lost sound and could not unmute. So could you, sorry, what question are we on? Oh, we're just talking about the individual animal, animal consent. So how important and relevant is the idea of individual animal consent in industry practices or um, animal welfare research? And how might you approach assessing or obtaining it? Or do you, or is it relevant? Right, uh, it's definitely something I thought about, especially doing handling research where you know, you're imposing this negative state on animals, doing the full body restraint, knowing it's negative. Um, I think it's really, it's definitely really challenging. Um, I think this is why I love epidemiology because when animals are naturally exposed to something, you yourself don't have to choose to put that treatment on the animal. You sort of, you know, they have those natural exposures and you're just there collecting data. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's something that we definitely also struggle um, a lot about uh, well, within humans. So consent means really understanding um, and agreeing with you know what's going to happen with that animal or with that person. And even if we try to provide a person with all of you know everything, all the details we think is important, you know there could be language barriers. There could be um, other. Percept, per, perceptions about what they think is going to happen, but it doesn't actually happen and it's so completely different. So I think there's a lot of things that impact consent from a human perspective um, and from the animal side. I don't think it's obviously not possible. Um, we don't know. We can't know exactly what they're, how they're perceiving things. Um, we can infer, but they don't consent to participate. A lot of the times we use owners to do that. And so we assume, I mean, and it kind of does bias some research where those owners signing their cats up for the research probably aren't the ones that are, you know, for, they're signing up for a, a, an examination on a vet clinic for a mock exam. They're probably not the cats that freak out and get really, really stressed at the, at the vet because why would, you know, the owners probably wouldn't choose to put their cats in that situation. We know that's also very stressful for the owners to see. Um, but I think, yeah, it's a very challenging question. Um, no, thank you. Yeah, I, I was also going to ask you to speak to because I, I my initial thought with because I, I also work with um, companion animals, I work with dogs. And so my initial thought was, well, I guess I have um, breeders or owners who are consenting for their animal who have knowledge of their animal's behavior and similar to a parent perhaps consenting properly for their child. Um, but then you have owners of farms that own tons of animals, can they consent individually for their animals? Do they know their animals that way? And then you add additionally the purpose of the animal and it, and it gets very complicated, but thank you for, for working with us on this question. I know, I know it was a tricky one. Um, Joanna, do you wanna to speak to this? Yeah, um, 
huge issue, I think, within animal research in laboratories. I don't think there's any way to, to get their consent to participate or be used in ways that will harm them, which is most of the time. Um, there's ways to get their consent for specific procedures, and that's mo done more with bigger animals such as dogs or macaques, where you train them using positive reinforcement to, for example, give out your limb so that we can take do an injection or take blood, and then you receive um, a treat in exchange. So they can consent to specific procedures like this, but again, they can't consent to the, you know, that substance that you're injecting into them is going to give them Parkinson-like symptoms, for example. Um, so there's issues there, and I don't know that we can get around that at all. Um, if you talk about non-invasive research or behavioral cognitive research, that's fine. Like any procedure that doesn't impact them beyond that session that they chose to participate in, um, that can work. So there's free-ranging colonies of macaques, for example, that are being studied. Um, and so the researchers just come in and the animals choose to interact with them or not, um, and then they leave. So that it is possible for some limited types of research, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, Sarah, what are your thoughts on this? I don't think non-human animals can provide informed consent because they don't know what the risks uh, of or consequences of the intended activity is going to result in, right? So perhaps they can cooperate in research and we see that in captive wildlife where they, like Joanna said, they're trained through reinforcement to give out a limb to get an injection, but they don't know what's in the injection. They didn't consent to being in captivity in the first place. So there's a, a, a lot of different considerations. For free living wildlife, there are still negative impacts even from observers. So I think that they're not consenting to, to that necessarily. And there may be some rewards that they're receiving if they're interacting with researchers. So um, again, I think it's, it's more consideration of, of cooperation rather than informed consent. I really like that you brought up cooperation because I, I also obviously know in no way can you get informed consent because you can't communicate what the research is about. But I really like the idea of, of cooperation and perhaps how much can we allow this to be a cooperation where we're, um, we're letting them choose to do get, perform certain behaviors or do certain things for a reward that they will choose to perform. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Lynn, what are, your, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I totally agree with Sarah. It's, it's, you can get the animals to cooperate through positive rewards. Um, but certainly working with fishes, they, you know, you can't get the consent to take them out of the water and take a blood sample. You know, they really do not wish for that to happen. They don't want to be removed from the water. And I think the way that we use fishes and, you know, whether we're catching them in large scale fisheries or as an individual or, um, you know, we're farming them in aquaculture or we're using them in large numbers in experiments. We really subject the fish to these things rather than get their consent or and in many cases, even their cooperation is lacking um, and they're really subjected to, to these situations. The only thing I, I think I would say would res resemble consent is I was in an aquarium in Paris and um, there was a tank of koi fish and they seemed to like humans touching them. And so they allowed people to sort of, it's called trout tickling actually, they allowed um, you know, children to touch them and, and, and they actually engaged with that they weren't swimming away they were actually allowing the humans to touch them and you also see quite a lot of videos on social media where divers interact with fishes um, and the fish will swim up to them um, and you see sharks swimming up to divers and actually um, they engage in what looks like petting um, you know like you would pet your dog and it, it does seem like the animals are in, enjoying it but they're certainly voluntarily engaging with this but otherwise, I think generally with fishes, we subject them to things. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you for going with us on that. That was um, such an interesting conversation. Um, Anna, do you want to take away one of our last questions? I'm just going to pop away for one moment. So take it away, Anna. OK, awesome. Um, so we were just wondering, um, while we all care about animal welfare and animal well-being, uh, we're still researchers and doing performing research studies. And sometimes those include things like non-enriched controls or the culling of healthy animals for dissection. Um, and we were just generally wondering what your opinions are on, on the balance between 
um, these in the invasiveness and the, the quality of data versus your own opinion on on the well-being of your research animals and like how you deal with this. Um, Lynn, do you maybe wanna wanna just continue? Sure. Yeah. I guess um, many ethics committees do the harm benefit analysis. What are the costs to the animal, and what are the benefits to the humans in doing this? And so your example of you know killing of healthy animals just for education purposes. Well, perhaps if those animals have been kept in good welfare and then they were killed humanely and then actually a large number of, of humans benefit from that educational experience and perhaps like, for example, trainee vets um, have a better feel for the anatomy of these animals because of it, then there is a benefit there to the humans that you could suggest outweighs the cost to the animal. Um, it is a, a kind of a difficult subject because, you know, in, in animal welfare, you have to cause poor welfare in order to study it. And so at, at that point, you really have to justify it in terms of the three R's. Are you doing the are you using the minimum number of animals that will achieve the objectives? Are you using the least invasive techniques? You know, what are the humane endpoints? Um, and certainly when you're dealing with whole animals, you can't replace them. And so it's, it really becomes kind of an ethical and moral question. You know, are you doing the best possible thing that you can for these animals, even though that you are going to deliberately cause poor welfare in order to study it? And in and, and, and my research, I do do that, which, you know, I struggle with. But if I do work on pain in fishes and I show to the governments and to regulatory bodies, sound sank scientific evidence that these animals suffer then that will lead to benefits in terms of improved regulations and legislation for the protection of these animals so can, you know as long as I keep the sample sizes low and the experiments are short and that the animals suffer for the least amount of time can I justify that in that sense so I think I think it is kind of a harms benefit analysis and so sorry I take quite a pragmatic view um, I think we should avoid it, of course, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, in, in some cases, if you want things to change, you have to have the evidence to prove mm -hmm. that the animals are capable of suffering, sadly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and you made a good point there with the, the importance of the three R's, and Joanna, you actually received a, a prize from the National Center for the Three R's for your work in, in lab rats, so is there anything that you would like to to add to this. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with Lynn. It's really difficult. It's a constant struggle and ethical debate that you have with yourself because you know you're not doing the best you can for these animals, but in order to improve something, you have to, you often compare to the baseline and show, hey, like this is so much better. So it's difficult. Um, you try to do your best. Like I personally draw the line at causing harm beyond the harms of standard housing, which are huge. Um, but then again, you try to keep it as short as possible. And as soon as the few weeks are done, then you transfer them into something much better. So they do get to experience that. It's difficult. I mean, it's I'm, I'm kind of scaling back because it's taking a toll. Um, interestingly, you mentioned the, the study that got the prize. The cool thing there is that the study was really a lot about what animals do in great environments or better environments. And so I don't know that that control was necessarily needed there. I think a lot of people like to see, learn about animals and what they do in more natural states. Um, so there's definitely scope for doing that type of research as well without necessarily having those negative controls. Um, yeah, and just being really creative. Doing things better often requires a lot more thought um, than just doing it the way it's been done. Um, and there was one more point I wanted to say, right? So for example, my lab studies euthanasia methods for rats and mice. Originally, we housed them almost in standard cages and then you do your euthanasia, but there's no reason to do that at all. Like you can do so much better than the standard um, and they participate in research that isn't necessarily invasive because they have the choice. So there are ways to do it better, um, but it takes time. Thank you. 
for sharing that. Um, Cassandra, what's, uh, what's it like in agriculture? <laughs> I think that in my, in my group, we're thinking about this, you know, with, with each experiment that we run and that for me personally, I, I'm not, I'm only taking advantage of things that are already happening. So I won't impose like if a, if a painful procedure is not already part of standard practice or how the animals are being managed, I won't, I won't do it. Um, so I'm, I'm just really looking for, and, and, and if that means then we take a, a question off the table um, because that's, it's something that's not already, not already occurring, then, then that's fine. And, and I, I have done experiments where we have, um, you know, we have looked at what's happened to the animals after death, but again, there, like I'm only, piggybacking on something that was already already going to happen um, and there's no shortage of questions that can be asked in that way is my experience thank you um i can imagine sarah that the the situation might be similar for you but i might be wrong about that i think again it depends on captive versus wild, um, free living wildlife. And, you know, but going into, of course, any animal welfare research with wildlife, you should go in with a do no harm principle of, you know, yes, if you're piggybacking off of existing um, experiences of, of animals or, or research that um, is important, but not to cause necessarily harm in, in research. And the BCSBCA, we actually created research guidelines for our own activities and our own animals, and we would not allow a negative control or invasive research that causes pain. Um, so there's some kind of strict language around that in terms of what we actively engage in, but we also partner or support research, um, for example, in the pest control industry. So we're hoping that, you know, uh, more humane uh, killing methods are developed and that is, you know, hopefully going to replace some of the rodenticides and other ways that these animals suffer. So um, it is, challenging definitely to um, address this issue, I think, in those types of sectors where it's just given for granted that these animals are going to suffer and die. So it's um, a matter of finding a better method of, of humane killing. Yes, thank you for, for that point. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, Carly, that might be similar for you that there are situations uh, where it's not necessary maybe to have negative controls. Um, but then again, there's things like shelters where you might need to study not enriched controls to see what, how the animals are doing. So what's what's been your experience with this? I think it depends on the setting. The other thing is when we do research with companion animals, we don't own the animals, we don't purchase them. We're generally using animals that we don't have a lot of control over how they're housed and that kind of thing. It's up to the shelter um, or the owner, the pet owner own, you know, so it's, it's a little bit different in that way. Um, so we'll usually use like existing conditions as sort of the, you know, the control and then add something or, um, and I just wanted to note for the lab animal stuff, I think it does depend on geographic location. So um, when I worked for Charles River, uh, I, you know, we worked at U.S. facilities and mostly, and their standard housing is different than standard housing in Europe. And so we do, you do different research because of that. So we use the standard, you know, with one tissue for five mice, whereas if you're in Europe, it might be the standard is a larger cage, two nest pucks, two tissues, that kind of thing. So I feel like geographic location of where the research being is being conducted really changes types of questions you ask and what you can sort of do. Um, and so, yeah, def definitely differences between Canada, US and European um, laboratory animal behavior and welfare research. Um, yeah, and going back to companion animals. So yeah, it's usually the natural exposure type thing. So sort of just using what's already existing, you know, for example, you can look at shelters and colony type style housing versus um, one cat in a, in a smaller kennel size cage. So um, a lot of, yeah, we don't have a lot of control because we don't own the animals. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, Quinn, 
do we want to move on to the last questions or do we want to skip it and go um, to audience? Yeah, I think we're going to honestly pop over to um, some audience questions, but I'm going to release um, one more poll and I just want all of the um, panelists to just answer the poll, but out loud. Um, and we can elaborate on it later, but I was just interested. So basically the question is, do you ever experience compassion fatigue or cognitive dissonance surrounding animal suffering in research meant to improve animal welfare? And in the poll, I have kind of a Likert scale, but if you just wanna like real quick, whether or not you experience this or um, yeah, your, your quick opinion, um, starting with Carly. Sorry. Um... So the cognitive dissonance thing, I think is, I'm going to go more on my lab animal <laughs> um, experience for this one, just because companion, I would say not so much because they're companion animals. Um, but definitely when I worked in lab animal, I think, yeah, it's really challenging working in an industry where maybe you don't agree with everything that's happening and seeing a lot of suffering and you're seeing it taking its toll on the veterinarians, the vet techs, the research techs, you know, it really takes a toll on everyone. Um, but I also think it's like a driver for change. People work in that industry because, well, most people <laughs> work in that industry because they care about the animals, you know, they, they, they agree with the benefit to society in terms of um, biomedical testing, but they also are there because they want to help the animals. And so I think having that, and they're trusted, they're in the industry. And I think those people can make a lot of change, even though it's a culture that is definitely resistant to change. And it's like an uphill battle <laughs> sometimes. Um, culture is very hard to change and it's not gonna happen quickly. It's very slow. Um, but I think that's like a huge driver for change as well. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, Sarah, do you have a similar opinion? Yeah, so of course, in the shelter world and the BCSPCA's frontline staff, you know, experience compassion fatigue, you know, at unfortunately high levels, um, as well as our veterinary facilities. And I think that we see definitely cognitive dissonance in the wildlife management, um, very disconnected from individual animals, focusing on species and populations. And, but I think one of the things that um, I've seen also with our frontline staff is, is moral injury. And I think that that's a result of resources. So having something, you having to do something that is actually against your moral compass is unfortunately as a result of uh, a lack of resources, whether it's funding to cover medical expenses for an animal, whether it's wildlife rehabilitation and animals, you know, you just don't have the staff um, or the support, you know, the funds to pay a veterinarian to treat a potentially treatable wild animal you have to make a lot of different choices in terms of how you allocate resources when you work for a nonprofit organization. So I, I think that is a, a key factor as well. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Um, Cassandra, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you definitely see, especially, you know, you, you know, you see really tough things sometimes. Um, and I, I guess I'm not, I'm not sure I relate so much to thinking about it as fatigue, but rather a place where social support is needed. Um, that really being able to have people that you can talk about what you're seeing with and, and to digest it um, and to know that you're not alone, I think is really important. Yeah, absolutely. I think honestly, that was the purpose of adding this question at the end, just so um, people watching and, and everyone could understand that. It, I think it is a very real a, a real feeling for a lot of people and um, important to, to share and talk about that people can have emotions about research that's happening, especially to do with ethics. So absolutely. Um, Lynn, what are your opinions on this? Yeah, I think um, COVID was a bit of a disaster for this because um, so many facilities had to kill lots and lots of healthy animals because they just didn't have the staff or they just didn't have the time to look after them anymore. And it was a very a sad situation that, you know, people were having to euthanize all these health, large numbers of healthy animals. And I think it was a pretty terrible thing to happen to people. Um, I know... Um, colleagues who actually had very special you know lines of fish and actually took them home and and actually set them up at home so they could actually keep them 
because they were just so dedicated to you know keeping these animals alive but um I think yeah I think it, it is something that that maybe the industry needs to think a bit more about that you know people who provide care actually can be exhausting and if they're forced to do something they don't really feel they don't want to do for whatever purpose you know people need more support really yes absolutely I totally agree with you on that um Joanna yeah um I agree with almost everybody um Carly spot on with with this the pain that you feel and the sadness about what's happening also being the driver that motivates you to keep going so it's like this balance and some days you're just over it it's harder and other days you're super motivated because you want to change so it's kind of a constant back and forth um, at least for me I one thing I struggle with is the really slow pace of change so I find over time that like I started so driven it's like I'm gonna you know you're gonna change but as 15 years go by and barely anything has changed despite all this research, that's when that driver kind of loses its power. Um, I agree with Sarah with the moral injury. Um, sometimes we're forced to do things because we don't have a choice, really. We don't have the resources to do it better. Um, Cassandra already said she's working with animals in the system. When you work with lab animal research, often you, you have to get those animals in for your research. So as much as possible, we use surplus animals or we tag on to research that's already there. It's hard. A lot of the times it's just the research that doesn't work out because you have such a wide range of animals or the PI that's doing a lot of the research doesn't really, um, isn't super helpful. And then you lose data. So it's, so it's hard, but you do it as much as you can. But in situations where you bring in, you're responsible for bringing those animals in. Um, that's hard. And then often you have to euthanize them and you really don't want to, but institutions limit how much you can advertise that you have animals. So we'll advertise to undergraduate students in our animal behavior classes, but that's about the extent of it. And at some point, like the PI won't let you keep them forever because that's really costly. It's not good for the animals either. So it's, it's really difficult. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you all for sharing everything. And um, that kind of wraps up our, our questions here. So we'll dive into a few um, targeted um, audience questions before we let you go today. But just um, I would just like to say a huge thank you to all the panelists that came and all of the attendees. Um, we so, so much value your opinions and it was so awesome to hear your explanations and I hope everyone learned something. And um, I hope this brought people together into a bit of a community where we see we have a lot more similarities than differences, I think a lot of the time. Um, also, if you want to share your own opinions as an audience member, um, we've created a Qualtrics survey and we would love to hear um, your answers to all of our questions. So if you would like to share, please fill out the survey. We would love to hear what you have to say. Um, um, so I'm going to read some from the chat. Um, if you have a question, you'd like to say it, just raise your hand, but I'll read some from the chat while we while we keep going. Um, I think, Cassandra, I'm going to target this one to you because it's more agriculture related. Um, so Mike says, how important do you feel the animal welfare that animal welfare is to the general public? Uh, we have companies who try to differentiate their products by identifying animal friendly. Um, but when we sell agricultural products, uh, we have great difficulty getting the public to pay any more for higher wealth welfare systems and the people who are buying specialty products don't seem to be expanding and like most of the food is still sold strictly on a on a higher price so can you speak to that a little bit yeah I mean I think that I think that most people think if I was to generalize for the public I, I think that most people think these things are already being taken care of so they're surprised when they hear that, like for example, in the US that there's not legislation that covers um, the care of animals that we raise for food, like the husbandry practices are not, are not regulated. Um, so I, I, I think it's difficult. I think we run into this challenge that we're asking, it makes sense to me that people don't wanna pay more for something that they already think is happening. Um, and that, that's, a real, that's a real challenge about, about that how the entire agricultural system is structured um, in terms of creating financial financial incentive. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, okay, I, I'm also gonna say, um, I'm gonna target this one to Joanna because it's a bit more um, research focused, um, but do you think that non-transparency um, of research fields 
um, towards general public is a problem. So this person is from Switzerland and the non-transparency of research has been a problem because they see the general public has now launched an if initiative to prohibit all animal research, but this would also include research targeted to improve animal welfare. Um, and so do you think that um, the fact that the public is unaware of this research or maybe the harms that and benefit cost analysis isn't as transparent? Do you think this is impacting public awareness and understanding of what animal welfare research really does? Probably. I think it's non-transparent because researchers are afraid that exactly that, that people are going to be supposed and want it to stop it. But in fact, research shows that when you are more transparent, people have more trust. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be opposed to it. I think it'd be great if the public was a part of this discussion and maybe as a society, I mean, they're paying for it. And as a society, we should be able to have these discussions about what is acceptable or what is the acceptable treatment or harms that we're causing these animals for the benefits that we're expecting. Um, I find that in Europe, I mean, there, around the world, there's a push towards transparency. I find that in Europe, that's kind of going the right way where there's, it's more open to discussion and being honest about what actually happens. Whereas you have these same panels at conferences in North America where transparency, the only goal is to increase public support. So they're not, they're not going to talk about the harms. They're not going to really, they're just going to show the best case scenario and say like, this is, so yeah, to me, it's astounding when you have the same transparency discussion at a European conference versus a North American conference and the goals are so different. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's a very interesting topic. Um, aim towards Lynn on, um, uh, aquaculture. Um, Daniel has wanted to ask what factors contributed to fish, primarily zebra fish, to be models of welfare research? Um, do you, or for rest, welfare research, do you think uh, short generations or public feelings that rodents are more charismatic contributed to this at all? Or, or what do you think the driving force behind that was? Well, thanks, Daniel, for the interesting question. I think fish models have become much more popular because, and I hate to say it, they are less expensive the rodent models and particularly with zebra fish there's a whole industry in terms of their husbandry and you can buy all sorts of automated housing racks um, but they they're very small fish so they're only one gram they're about this size and you can keep lots of them in a very small space and they're much cheaper to keep than rodents and so more and more researchers are turning to fish models um, yeah, particularly zebra fish because of just their ease of use and the, the fact that they cost less. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Aileen, I see you have your little hand up. Um, go for it. <laughs> Hi, thank you all so much. This was so interesting. Um, I want you to go back to like, I think maybe the first question that got brought up. And I was wondering if maybe some of the panelists could comment a little further on Miriam Dawkins' definition or conception of welfare. Just because for so long, she was like a fairly strong advocate of defining animal welfare in terms of effective state. And then her newer conception is sort of to help address the fact that we can't confirm that animals are sentient or conscious. And so she suggests that if we define it as like biological functioning balanced with what animals want, this sort of um, doesn't assume that we know whether animals are sentient. But for me, I think some other people, it raises the question of like, what is a want in an organism that we aren't assuming is sentient? And then if we apply this definition, how do we draw the line on like which species we're concerned about in terms of their welfare? Just, I guess, have you guys struggled with this? How do you sort of re resolve these things? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Aileen, do you wanna target it towards someone and then, and then other people can answer? Um, I mean, maybe Cassandra, you were the first to bring bring up the conception. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. I mean, I think so raising the yeah no it's no it's like it's a great question. <laughs> See, raising raising the concern that about the assumption of about you know sort of what do we. Do we, do we have a, some kind of base level of capacity that we think the animals need to have in order to warrant consideration? Is that, am I understanding? Yeah, because uh, her idea is that this conception doesn't require the assumption that animals are sentient. 
um, which I think is great, but if, yeah, just then where do we draw the line? And if we're gonna choose a marker of welfare in an organism that we're not assuming is sentient, then I think it could extend to something like plants because they have clear markers of biological functioning. And if they grow towards sunlight, it, it would almost seem like a measure of preference. But in animals, we, we care about those things so much because they're sentient, or at least that's why the logic I see a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah, maybe, I mean, I guess maybe too, I think it, maybe it depends a little bit too on what we mean by sentience or, or also I think like she's also using, thinking about consciousness in, in some of the way she's describing it. And, and I guess I, I'm coming at it from the perspective of a very like, <laughs> maybe because I also study pain, like really at a very basic, at a very basic level, <laughs> um, animals get included <laughs> in, in how I'm, I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. If there's basically. anyone else that has any thoughts, please feel free to jump in. I was just going to, um, I recently read, yeah, Marion Dawkins' um, newest book that came out this year. And um, yeah, it's very basic. But I think knowing that it's animal welfare just excludes plants automatically. So she's definitely not talking about plants. Um, and then the other thing, but yeah, I see how you want to might, might want to, people might want to cross that over, but, um, and I think, like, at least from, I think the beginning of the book, it talks about, like, the consciousness club, so different people include different species as having, you know, as being sentient, and so trying to get away from that argument is just, like, if you think these animals are sentient, this is what we, we're trying to do, so trying to, like, get away from that all of just constantly arguing about what species sentient and what species not. Um, I think because it, it kind of, yeah. Yeah. It's like I, a block. <laughs> I don't know. No, I, I'm, I'm with you all there. I, I, yeah, it's absolutely such a challenge. I think I still am on the same page. It's like, we, we don't know, but we don't know which species are sentient or where to draw that line. Um, so then I still kind of proceed with the definition in terms of effective state. And then I just was wondering if anyone had thought about that workaround a little. <laughs> but yeah, thank you, Carly. And oh, thank you, all of you. Sorry. Thanks, Ailey. Um, I don't see any other hands up or any other questions. So I think we'll wrap it up here.